All right, let's try this again. Technical difficulties on a Monday. Welcome to Game Over International. This is fun. It's, uh, you know, we always have to do something wrong on Mondays. Last Monday, we had audio issues, couldn't get the stream going. Today, though, it's going to be fixed. I fixed it fast. We're going to go. Let's do this. All right, I'm going to bring in my guests. It's Patrick Bexel and Jared Book. How you doing, guys? Yes. It's your fault. That's right. Yeah, we, we get to actually talk to somebody who isn't Canadian for once. Although we've had we had uh, Eric Ayala on, who's American after the last uh, Canada USA game in women's hockey. So she got to bring the American perspective of that. So that was kind of fun. But uh, yeah, you're the first non North American we've had on the show, Patrick. It's a great honor. yeah yeah for sure i'm sure we'll talk about very serious topics but i think first we'll uh we got lots of stuff to talk about obviously both uh canadian hockey teams were in action over the last 24 hours we've got some record setting numbers for the women's team we've got two medals one for canada and also max perot we should shout out as ranking first in the big air qualifiers for snowboard which you know he's on track for his second gold medal of the games canada's only gold medal so far and also the curling, but, uh, okay. Somebody's saying Patrick's audio still seems broken. It shouldn't be broken. You want to test things out for us, Patrick? Yeah, I can, I can hear you. It says Patrick sound like robots. Interesting. Okay. So on my end that there's no issue, but what I'll do is, uh, let's see here. I think maybe, is it an issue with restream? Uh, it says, check your encoder settings, keyframe interval 0.69 recommended 2. I don't even know how to do that. It says keyframe intervals 2. I don't know, guys. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> yes, I guess they're going to be robots. I will try to uh, switch their audio quickly to a different input here while I'm talking. But uh, other than... No, I don't think so, Patrick. I don't think it's that because I can hear you fine. So I'm just going to change the input on Zoom and see if that works. And hopefully it's a little bit better. But uh, unfortunate if we continue to have audio issues, we're doing our best. But yeah, so it's uh, Eyes in the Prize reunion here. <laughs> if uh, people don't I, I, know. I, I think you left the day before I signed. So <laughs> Yes, I left because you were coming back. Same with Patrick. me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was trying to get away. Yeah, okay. So let's talk about the sports a little bit. Um, we'll we'll start with Canada's I, I, men. I, I, we'll, we'll save the Canada's women's stuff for a little bit because, okay, I got a message from the mod. Robert uh, says that it works. So switching it up works. Finally, <laughs> we figured it out. Someone says can't hear them at all. Should be good now. All right. Uh, so we'll, we'll save the Canada's women's stuff for a couple minutes because I feel like that's the more exciting stuff, but we'll talk about the men first <laughs> because they're a little bit more boring. Uh, they lost to the U S <laughs> they beat China, which is, you know, to be expected, well, but they're, they're, it was the miracle on ice according to the U S right. Oh my God. That was so funny. <laughs> you know, let... I, I feel for the guy that came up with that tweet or, or the person that came up with that tweet, uh, because I feel like history wise, it's, it's just, <laughs> It's so many mistakes in it. I can't even begin to 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 break it down. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. Uh... Eddie Pasquale reminds me a lot of Vladislav Tretiak. I don't know about you guys, but uh, I, I see. Are, are they the same similar. height? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Is that how you pronounce it, Eddie Pasquale? I thought it was Pascal. <laughs> it, it could be Pascal. I have no idea. I, I he played for the Ice Caps at one point, so they were both part of the Canadians organization. Tretiak was a Canadian draft pick. That's true. So there you go. Yeah, never came there over though. But yeah, no, it's a. Uh, I mean, <laughs> let the USA have it. It's been a tough go for them <laughs> at like the highest levels since 1996. 
Uh, someone <laughs> I saw also they were like, this is Canada's first win against the against Canada in the Olympics for like 12 years. And it's like, but it it's not, though. <laughs> like, listen, this men's tournament can be fun and maybe you care about it. But in terms of meaning anything, it doesn't like nobody is going to sit here and tell me that in the last Olympics that Russia won gold in a best on best tournament. Right. Like they didn't. It's not. <laughs> it was, this isn't real. It, it, the only thing that we remember from that is like uh, Kir Kirill Kaprizov scoring the, the, the Olympic winning gold and uh, Germany finishing second. Right. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, I remember Germany testing them, right? Like, that was the, ta the takeaway from the tournament for me, was that Germany, like, put up a real good fight in that gold medal game, and there was a chance that they could have actually won. But, yeah, I mean... Yeah, they beat Sweden in the quarters. They beat Canada in the semis. Because that's right. Because I got so much trash in, in, <laughs> in the ice on the prize chat for, for getting losing to Germany, and then seconds later, like, I could I could have it back. Like, but, but I mean... Uh, Germany was very smart. I, I said that about Germany in, in the previews with, with Scott and Laura as well on Locked on Canadians that, you know, they were re really smart last time. They're doing something similar this time. I'm not sure it worked this time, but but they took essentially two teams and brought the two best lines from, from both teams. So they had the chemistry already sorted. Yeah, yeah, and it makes sense. I th feel like uh, somebody says uh, thoughts on Team China's performance. Ho Sang had high praise for them after the game. I think the advantage that Team China had is that they essentially brought a full team that already played together in the KHL in the Kunlun Red Star. Uh, I think it made sense for them, but at the same time, I mean, they're not going to win <laughs> win the tournament, yeah, right? I, I, mean, I think, yeah, I, I think I think the the big thing for China is that they're probably the happiest that NHLers aren't there because yes, they make the, they make they make the scores look much more presentable. I mean, losing five nothing to Canada um is probably a win for them and i mean not a win but but you know as close as you can get to one i mean it's it's respectable i think the u.s was seven if not Half mistaken the so, I mean, it's a u.s players anyway right <laughs> yeah i mean that's the whole thing i mean even the, the women's team um is, is very similar to that but i think you know going back to, to the 2018 discussion i think the storyline is that russia had such a hard time winning gold <laughs> that's that's what i'm going to take away from the 2018 tournament and and this one is 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 kind of similar i mean they what they won both their first games by one goal um, yeah, I, didn't even have, I, I have to be honest here i didn't even have canada winning gold this this tournament no i don't think that they're favored no. i think that uh it's still roc or russia that's favored right like they just have the better pool of players to pick from no oh, no 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 uh, the team is not good enough. The team uh, is imploding as we speak. We see it, you know, with the power play performance. You see people not gelling. Finland will win this gold. Oh, I hope so. That'd they be the, great. They, they, they have the best coach available and they have a team that will fight for each other. You, you mean Coach Julian is not the best coach available? <laughs> I'm not sure about that. Let's leave it at that. <laughs> UK, right, so I think has, looking uh, at... Has, looking at this uh, men's team, <laughs> looking at this men's team, I think my takeaway is: Are they too slow? <laughs> I, they're, they're, it's an older team, right? It like, is. It, it's it's a very old team, like except for Owen Power and Mason McTavish, basically, and Ken Johnson, I guess. Um, it, like D David Darnay, like it's a great story, but he hasn't been in the NHL for what four or five years. <laughs> you know, Jordan, Jordan <laughs> Wheel. Jordan, Jordan Wheel was, you know, a great AHL player last year, but like it just strikes me as as a, a team like Daniel Winnick. Like, I, it's just a, it's such a weird group of, of players, and, and I think it's you know, Hockey Canada they outsmart themselves very often. <laughs> like it, they just do this all the time, where it's like, oh, we can't take young players. Like you're telling me that Caden Gooley wouldn't be like right for this team like it just i don't know it doesn't make he's, sense he's on me, an but, nhl yeah. contract so he can't go right no he could mason mctavish could, played yeah. in the nhl this year yeah yeah right. you can't as long be as it's, in the as american as hockey league i think as long as it's um your contract is um what's the word i'm looking for like going to the next year um it it, it doesn't count anymore basically okay yeah so yeah i feel like you, you go through this team and you know I don't have ice time in front of me because the Olympics are not tracked nearly as nicely as I would like in a centralized location that's easily accessed. But 
you know, Kent Johnson is the point leader, Eric O'Dell right behind. But I'm just wondering, like, is Mason McTavish getting enough ice time? You know, I know he was on the first line last game, but I look at the way that the United States is handling this whole situation and they seem to be leaning heavily on the youth movement and Canada's not. And aside from being less entertaining this way, like, I like the idea of bringing some veterans along. But if you're like, I saw last game, Eric Stahl played like 18 minutes. Should Eric Stahl be playing 18 minutes in the Olympics at age 37? <laughs> I, I think, no. you know, like w w when you look at it, uh, obviously you have to look at who's available first and foremost. And there, there is not players in their prime that are in Europe for either team. Then you can choose from that. Either you go um, with youth as us did or, or you go with experience that canada did and and yeah they might be too slow they might also be leaning very heavily on not since it's an olympic size drink obviously uh, not getting um drawn into areas where they're not comfortable in where to leave gaps between the goal and and the last defender etc cetera, etc cetera, to create space where there shouldn't be space normally yeah it, it seems like they want to play a grinding game and Unfortunately, I find every single time the Canadian like group think like Hockey Canada wants to do that, it ends up being a massive mistake. But let's move on from the men's team. Let's talk about some fun stuff because the men's team, I just I can't bring myself to be that interested in a men's hockey tournament that like World Juniors is great because it's best on best for an age group. World Championships, I feel like is great because you have like a higher standard of talent. It's not best on best, so you don't get like fully into it, but it's still fun, right? And this is just to me a glorified Spangler Cup without the fun. <laughs> without and, the nice arena, you mean? Yes, without the without the <laughs> the car in the stands, couple. you know, and <laughs> all the advertising advertising everywhere. So like, I don't know. I, I just mean, don't. Like, seri seriously, Andrew. I mean, you got to know Davos. Uh, ice hockey arena is probably the nicest one in the world yeah yeah it's like a chapel made out of wood that's cool go find go, go find an image of it because it's really so, so before you slack you know the car and all that look at the arena <laughs> all right i'll go look at the arena i'll have to i want to go to one of those like eventually at some point in my life whereas this i really don't have any interest i want to see a best on best <laughs> hockey tournament that actually means something not this garbage so anyway best on best hockey tournament for the women uh, the Canadian women, I mean, I was talking last night, I think Jared was involved in the conversation as well, that this might be the best Canadian women's team of all time. They've scored, I think, uh, Curtis Morrison, I saw on Twitter, tweeted like, last night, they scored 54 goals in six games. Yeah. It, <laughs> fair. 11 of them came against me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they've been it's... ripping on everyone. They, they, they play more games, so, like, the record is kind of, like, offset. Like, I don't think this is the most dominant team in, in Canadian women's hockey history, but I think it's definitely among the best, if not the best. Like, I, I don't think you can make that argument. Like, this team is just so deep. Like, it, it's it's ridiculous. Like, the, the question going into this tournament was defense, right? It was, there's no Laura Fortino. There's no... Uh, Bridget Laquette, there, there's, it was a, a turnover on defense, a, a pretty significant one. No Megan Mickelson, obviously, as well. And then you go into this tournament, and Claire Thompson is, is ridiculous. Aaron Ambrose is, is ridiculous. That, that, that pair is plus, I think they went on the ice for 32 goals um, at even strength and only like two against. Like it's just ridiculous numbers. And then, you know, that even doesn't even factor in the what they're playing as a top pair, which is Jocelyn LaRock and Renata Fast which is kind of like the shutdown pair. And it's just, it, the, the coaching seems to be at a different level as well. Like, I feel like Hockey Canada, we talk about Hockey Canada with the men's team. The, the coaching has held it back for at least two or three Olympic cycles. And I think now the coaching is, is on par with the players and, and the combination is, is just a, a really, really good team. Whether or not they win gold, like, I don't think that matters. I think this is still what the best team in, in Canadian hockey history, women's hockey history. Yeah, I think that's my my big takeaway from this is like the only game where they haven't been dominant was the one against the U.S. And I think it's tempting to say like, oh, well, they're 
not as good as the U.S. team. They couldn't control them. But they were also playing the second game in under 20 hours. And the game they played before, they were playing with masks on. And, I mean, working out in an N95, especially high-intensity interval training, which is what hockey is, you can't ever catch your breath. And when you're doing that for, like, playing 20 minutes, even 10 minutes at the highest levels of hockey, I guarantee all those women were completely bagged the next day. And it wasn't until the U.S. took the lead at two to one that everyone was like, OK, we got to dig deep here and push because it's not happening. <laughs> we we can't just sit on a one goal lead to beat this team. And all of a sudden they're like, bang, 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 score three goals, win the game. And I just I don't know if I've ever seen a more dynamic team. And I know that like Haley Wickenheiser has had a better tournament personally than uh, anyone so far has had. I believe her all-time best tournament is something like 18 points no 17 points in five games in 2006 which is unbelievable <laughs> but that three three and a half point a game yeah 3.4 <laughs> points per game but sarah nurse is actually only one point back from tying that and it's not like she's alone that's the crazy thing about this team sarah nurse 16 points mary philippe Poulin, 14 points natalie spooner 14 points brianne jenner 13 points claire thompson setting the defensing defensive scoring record for the tournament 12 points and then you've got sarah fillier who has eight goals and three assists at 11 points and rebecca johnson who's been fantastic in all other af- asset uh, areas of the game and also has 10 points like and jamie lee rattray who's playing 12 minutes a game has nine points five goals in six games like I don't think I've ever seen a team and I know they're not playing like the U S every night. I've never seen a team for team Canada score at will so easily. And that's what excites me about this team is it seems like after watching like the 2018 Olympics, the Canadian team dominated the puck, but it seemed like there was at times struggles to get things done. Right. And this year it seems like they just have that magic. And I'm really excited for the future of women's hockey in Canada because it seems like the skill level is just out of this world. Yeah, well, I think a big factor and and the reason why the gap seems so wide between Canada, even the U.S. and, and the other countries is that for the last 24 months, all these women were working on is strength, conditioning and skill. That's all you can get on the ice for. And even when you could get on the ice, it's like one person at a time and, and things like that. So I think that what's happening is that they just had so much time to work on skill and their conditioning. And Canada and the U.S. were always like the fittest teams anyway, right? Because they have, they've been, I mean, Hockey Canada cut Anne Renee Debian because she failed the boot test. Like they, they've been focusing on fitness for years now. But the difference is now is that they, they, they take basically the best and fittest athletes that they had in the pool and they said, here, work out for 24 months. And, and so it, everyone's just stronger and, and better and more explosive. And you can really see that happening. And then the coaching is, is a big part of this as well, because they, they don't feel like they're going to be benched, you know, like in 2018, the gold medal game, they played like three defenders yeah. in an, in an overtime game that went 20 minutes in overtime. Laura Fertino played like 40 minutes. Uh, Bridget Lequette got one shift at the end of overtime because there was a power play. And that was her first shift since the second period. Like just ridiculous coaching decisions that have no business in, in, you know, trying to win. Like it just ridiculous coaching. Like Jamie Lee Rattray, Aaron Ambrose were cut from that team. Right. Like imagine this team Canada without those two players. And, and it's just, I think that they overthink it. And this time they're just saying, listen, Sarah Fillier is our best, our number two center. Great. She'll be our number two center <laughs> and, and just going for it. And, and it's just a great result. And, and, and they're just playing so well, like everyone has chemistry. And, and I think that that's a, a major thing too. Like they've been playing the same lines since basically two years, you know, last, last time they basically since the lead up to the world championships, it's been Poulin Jenner. It's been Fillier, uh, Spooner, Daou, uh, when Daou was not there and then Turnbull and Clark on, on the third line. And, uh, combination on the fourth like it's it just been everything has been basically playing together since for the last year and i think that that's a big difference yeah it sure seems that way um also of note uh brianne jenner has tied the all-time single tournament uh goal record for the olympics with uh megan augusta although in one more game so interesting to see if she can break that in the gold medal game because 
obviously the women are heading to the gold medal. But perhaps a bigger story to me is that if Mary Philippe Poulain has some gold medal magic up her sleeve for the final game, if she nets a hat trick, she ties Haley Wickenheiser all time in goals. Yeah. I will keep you going for another four years if you don't. <laughs> I, would, I think she'll play again in four years. <laughs> I, I, I would think so. I mean, she's about 30 now. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it, it's definitely possible. And, and that's the thing is like this Canadian team by, by age alone is, is like the oldest they've had in Olympic history. Um, you know, close to 98, close to 2006, a little bit. Um, but the thing is, is that the older players on this team, like you could first see them going in four years again, except for maybe the, the exception is maybe Jocelyn Laroc, who's I think the oldest at 34. But Pelé is 30. She'll, she can play in four years. Jenner uh, is 29, I think. So uh, Daou is, is about the same age as well. So, I mean, it, it's no one, there's no like real 40 year old on this Canadian team. And I think that's a sign of obviously where women's hockey is, is that the, the younger generation is coming up and, and stronger. But I mean, the, most of this Canadian team will be playing again in four years. And I think that that's uh, an interesting storyline. But yeah, Poulet is, I, I said this the first time I think we were on and, and I, I tweeted about this as well, but she has the knack of like not, not doing anything outrageous and you look and she's top, top five in scoring. And, and then she, you know, then she finally gets the puck on her stick and she play, you know, scores two goals like she did uh, in, against Switzerland. And it's just like, that, that's what she can do. And the fact that she doesn't have to do that every night on this Canadian team is kind of a testament to the team itself, but also like she just makes everything go right. Like if, if she wasn't there with Sarah Philly had eight goals, I don't think so. Right. Because if, if you're, if you're trying to shut down Canada, you're not trying to shut down Sarah Philly and letting, Oh, well, you know what? We'll just let Poulain do her thing. No, you're trying to shut her down. She's still scoring. <laughs> and then she's able to, to, to open things up for other players. And I think it just, it's just, it's it's part of the dynamic of this team and also attested to how good she is. Like she kills penalties, she plays in the power play, she plays even strength. Uh, she's one of the best two way players in the game, even though we don't necessarily think of her that way. So, uh, yeah, but I, I think it's possible she can tie Haley Lickenheiser in the gold medal game. But uh, if she doesn't, I, I think she'll be back in four years. I hope yeah. so. She's I'm, taken. I'm that not ready for. A, yeah, I, I'm not ready for a women's hockey world without Maggie for the play. Like, I'm not ready for it. I, I know that she's, you know, on on the other side of, of 30, but I'm not ready for, for a women's hockey world without Maggie for the play. Yeah, and I feel like we should also probably shout out uh, Alina Muller because <laughs> as much as we talk about Canada and how dominant they've been and, you know, defense is a bit of an issue, that Swiss team, I thought, played <laughs> really strong while Mueller was on the ice. I mean, obviously, they were run out of the building eventually by Canada, but they, I thought they started strong, uh, got some good goaltending at, in sections of the game, and Mueller was just so dangerous. And I'm excited to see, like, I know going into the tournament, Mueller is considered one of the best players in the world, but it's nice to see, outside of goaltenders, a situation where forwards and defensemen from other countries are seen among the best players in the world in women's hockey. Cause I feel like we've been in a situation where the focus is solely on North America. And I know part of that's like funding, but <laughs> I was like blown away by how dynamic she was tonight. Yeah. I mean, Switzerland has two of the top 10 players in the world in, in Mueller and Lara Stalder. Like those are legitimate two of the top 10 players in the world. So I, I, I've never seen people like, you know, when I said that this could, could be the best Canadian team uh, in, in history, women's team in history, people are like, well, the best Canadian women's team in history wouldn't allow three goals to Switzerland. Switzerland has two of the top players in the world. Like, Lara Stalder and Ellen Miller would, would play on this Canadian team, right? Like, that's how good they are. Like, it, it's, they would play on any country in the world, in, in any league in the world, any women's league in the world. Like, they're, they're top talents. And I don't think that they get enough credit for that because they, I, I think that, I, I I just feel like if they had goaltending, this would have been like a completely different conversation, right? Like they scored three goals against Canada. And and I think that like, if they had like a goaltender that held them Canada, like four or five goals, we're having a completely different conversation today. And, and I think that that's um, a big, obviously Canada scores in bunches and they're a really good team. Um, but we saw what goaltending can do. I mean, look at the check against the uh, Czechia against the United States, um, you know, limiting them to one, one after 40 minutes, like, 
it, it's it's goaltending can can do things and and i'm you know we're, we're about an hour and a half away from finland usa and i'm very curious to see what that one's going to be like but you know switzerland is really talented and and uh, you know finland has some talented players as well and, and i think that the, the issue with most of these countries right now is the depth but but the skill is there and that's that's the exciting part for one's see that in, in, in somewhere i mean you mentioned depth and, and that's obviously where it is because you see in a in a sport like curling where you can put a program on uh for for the olympics take a look at italy as an example and and you get it done in four years or yeah. or, or at least eight years that those players have together more or less for sure i mean, I mean you know you, you, it's, and, it's and in, in, in hockey yeah in hockey you you need what 25 21, players at least yeah at least yeah but you got to have some reserves so so <laughs> let's say 25 and and in order to get that you need funding with deep pockets and, and you need an infrastructure and i think everyone knows about sweden's problems over the last couple of yeah since turin really um and where everyone thought you know this will work out and and they never did anything and put a old dinosaur in charge of of, uh, of hockey operations and for the women's team and obviously that didn't work out either because this approach to coaching was not good enough or or, or in first and foremost it was 20 years ago like before when he was <laughs> signed on for the job he still had the, the, the knowledge of, of 20 years ago and then he thought they were pros and they were not um the Swedish clubs have started now in SHL to have women's teams. And I think, you know, before we see a result of that, that's going to be another eight to 10, 12 years. That's like two to three Olympic periods, really. Yeah, it's unfortunate because I feel like after 2006, people expected that to be like <laughs> Finland and Sweden were going to be not Finland should at the have same been world level, champion, but... shouldn't they? Yeah. <laughs> with with well, a, I mean, you... Kim Martin was the original Nuaratu, right? Like, yeah. I, I don't think people like. I mean, it's it's easy to say now, but like, in 2006, I don't think like that. It, it's shocking to look back at it now, but in 2006, it was even more shocking than it maybe even was now because it, it was the gap was even larger in 2006. Oh yeah, yeah but it is on, now. On, like, on, like, on the other hand, a lot of the Swedish players in that team had been in the U.S. played for for yeah, U.S. College. teams and college yeah. teams. So so there were some development that they took with them. Erika Holst is the one I remember yeah. the most from that time. But but mm -hmm. seriously, it's it's. Uh, I think I think yeah, you have to look at it. Finland. It's like we say with Slovakia it's in in men's tournament. We say it with Switzerland in men's tournament as well. It it they get a golden generation or or you know you look at germany in in the, the world juniors or something like that you get two or three p players that come up but then you got to have so many more when, when it comes up to you know a big tournament especially when there are two really strong teams that are, are more or less certain to go to the finals with a few exceptions over the last what 18 yeah. years i've got a but comment been... here uh, sorry patrick uh yeah you had, to, you had to finish your thought there? Or? No, 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 no. It's fine. Okay. No comment. Uh, we got a comment here from Aaron Blackhouse saying, what about the player who broke the record for points by a defenseman in the Olympics? Yes. Claire Thompson. <laughs> we have to talk about Claire Thompson because absolutely incredible <laughs> amount of production from her. And it seems like she's doing it with relative ease. I don't know what your thoughts on that, Jared. Yeah, I mean, it's funny because I didn't really know much about Claire Thompson. Like, I've heard about her um through through Princeton people and people who follow the NCAA like um and and, and there's there's been a, a buzz about her but even at the world championship she wasn't showing what she's showing now like her growth in the last few months has been outstanding and and I mean that pairing of Aaron Ambrose just works like it, it's ridiculous they've been on the ice for uh I think 32 goals at, at five on five in this tournament and they've been on the ice for two goals against like it's ridiculous like she's plus 22 i don't like plus minus and I, there's problems with plus minus but when you're plus 22 in six games like almost, <laughs> in, in six games and it's not even like canada's outscoring a lot of teams but look at like joss and the rock and Renata fast like they're not nowhere close like they were plus seven they were plus eight in in the game against switzerland canada only scored 10 goals Right, yeah. like in they were on the ice for nine of the ten goals. They were on for one of the goals against. <laughs> but like, if you're on for nine of the ten goals as a as a defensive pair, 
like that that's a testament to your your ability like it's not it's not a fluke at that point it's not like you're you're you're, you're, you're you just happen to be on the ice when, when a goal goes in so i think that you know Erin ambrose for me was always like i think i thought she was always the best offensive defender in in canada but claire thompson has really impressed me just with her puck skills like look at the pass she made to uh, i think it was rattray rattray's goal um the second goal like that was just great great play and she has been really good with the puck, really poised and so young still. Like, like she's putting forward the best Canadian defensive performance since Catherine Ward. And Catherine Ward is probably the best Canadian defender of all time. And, and I think that, you know, I, I said this on Twitter you have it, like or during the game, this is probably going to be looked back on as Sarah Fillier's breakout. But Claire Thompson is probably even more important as a breakout performance for this Canadian team than, than Philly is because Canada has never had a problem developing forwards, but defense has been a struggle. And, and I think that that's a huge, huge benefit to this Canadian team and a reason why they're playing so well. It's not just the forwards, you know, how many times you talk about hockey where the offense comes from defense and, and that's what she and, and Aaron Ambrose are providing, you know, Jocelyn Rock and Renata Faster are closing it down on the other end. And, and it's, it's a great combination. And, and yeah, Claire Thompson has been great. And uh, we, we don't talk about her very much, but I think that's going to change um, after these Olympics. Absolutely. Yeah. And speaking of like unprecedented levels of production, because I feel like Claire Thompson's a young player. This is like surprising, but, uh, you know, it can happen, right? Where a young player breaks out. But a player who is like in their prime years, who has never really done anything close to this, Let's circle back to like the beginning of what we were talking about in this segment, which is Sarah Nurse. Um, you know, her production has been fine uh, in like the CWHL. She had a point per game season for the Toronto Furies. She had eight points in seven games in uh, World Championship back in 2018-19. But in terms of this level of offensive performance, we're seeing a totally different Sarah Nurse, uh, numbers that haven't occurred for her since her last year in the NCAA. Yeah, it's it's a great story, you know. And and she was like, you know, bottom six forwards for leading up to this tournament. Like she was in that conversation with like the Jill Sonnies, Laura Stacey's, uh, Emma Malte. Like that she was, you know, during Worlds, I think she played on the fourth line uh, a little bit as well. And you know, they they kind of made that switch. They switched her and Emily Clark on that top line. And and it really brought a different dynamic, and and she can she's one of the players who can score with a shot from anywhere, mm-hmm. um, and and she's really showing that. And you know she she had a couple of you know bar down shots uh, early on in the tournament, but I, I you know people are gonna say oh it's easy to play with Mary Philippe Poulet and Brianne Jenner, and and to some extent it is, but also you have to be in the right place because they're two very smart players, and and I think that if you're in the right place. Uh, you, you're going to get some goals and, and, and get some points. And it's a testament to her. And, and she's been playing great. Um, I think, yeah, breakout performance because, you know, it's there, there's kind of two generations, right? There's the, there's, there's the Brienne Jenner, Marie-Fou Poulain generation, you know, close to 30 Melody Daou, you know, age group. Then there's the Sarah Fillier, uh, MML Tay age group, which is, you know, early, other, you know, early 20s. And then there's that middle ground, you know, the Sarah Nurses, the... Uh, the uh, Jill Sonny, Laura Stacey's, you know, that age group is really coming of age in this tournament and, and is going to be expected to lead Canada in, in the next, you know, four to eight years. And, and I think that that's a great performance from her and, and really uh, necessary because I don't think we're talking about this Canadian team being as dominant as they are without Brianne Jenner, without Sarah Nurse, without, uh, you know, Natalie Spooner's renaissance um, on at, at forward. It's just, it's a great story. And, and yeah, Sarah Nurse is definitely having a, a coming out party for sure. All right. So I'm going to put you guys on the spot. Uh, gold medal game <laughs> is going to be too close to call because I think we all know what that game is going to be. But uh, who's going to win the bronze medal? Is it bad if I say <laughs> United States? <laughs> oh! <laughs> no, I, 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 I just don't think... I, 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 don't, I don't think that we should... I don't think we should necessarily count out Finland. Um you know, they, they had a really slow start to the tournament. Uh, playing Canada and the U.S. back-to-back will do that to you. Um, but but I think that, you know, I, I think that if, they, if Finland's in the bronze medal game, it's going to be Finland. But Switzerland's really good, too. Switzerland's really good. 
I mean, um, Switzerland has had a pretty good knack for keeping the scores down, even if they lost 10 3 this morning. But so, so if they can close out Finland, uh, keeping them on the outside, I don't see how they, you know, they can get that goal in and, and you know, carry the game in the way they want. I, it wouldn't surprise me. I go with the upset. Oh, Switzerland right. already beat Finland, didn't they? Didn't they, didn't they beat Finland in the round? Did off? they? So, I mean, yeah, I don't remember. Yeah, they did. Uh, yeah, they did. So I, I think it's, you know, Switzerland's really good. I'll, I'll go Switzerland. I'm okay with that. But also I think USA Finland is going to be pretty close. Unless yeah, USA I think it's going to be a really good might. game. Yeah. Unfortunately, I'm going to be sleeping during it because that's <laughs> the way it goes. All right. So before we close things out, I wanted to mention we, uh, Canada won a couple more medals overnight. Uh, Stephen Dubois they, they, won. They didn't win one in aerials now. She finished sixth, I think, or, or she just got in that sixth. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, Stephen Dubois won his second medal of the tournament in the men's short track 500 meter. Uh, he won a bronze and also Christine De Bruyne won the bronze in the first ever monobob. Although the gold medalist was <laughs> Kaylee Humphreys, formerly competing for Canada, but left due to uh, some claims about the, I believe the coaching and training staff, which Probably should have been a bigger story. I know it was a bit of a big story when she left, but probably should have been a bigger story that uh, shouldn't have been kind of hushed away. <laughs> oh, definitely. Well, it would be a bigger and, story and, now. <laughs> you're right. It would have been a bigger story now. <laughs> um, I, I think that the whole thing with, with Keely Humphreys, and, you know, usually when, when, when people switch countries and things like that, like there's like animosity. But if I, I don't know any Canadians that aren't cheering for Kaylee Humphreys, <laughs> like you know, like I just feel like she's so dominant, like she's the best ever in her sport. Yeah, I, I think I saw that the, her margin of victory was the largest in bobsleigh in like forty two years. Oh god! <laughs> so in any in, in any like level, like men's two men, two women bobs, like her 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 margin of victory was largest in history in forty two years. So I, I just think that it just dominant performance. And like, it's just crazy. Like she had to go through so much just to get to the Olympics between like qualifying and citizenship change and, and all that. And uh, yeah, she, we talk about, we talk about like dominant performances in, in Olympic sports and, you know, coming off a of discussion about women's hockey, it's kind of apropos, but um, I, I think that, yeah, that was just a dominant performance and she's one of the best ever. And um, I, I, if, if you're not happy for her, um, even if you're Canadian and maybe a little bit hurt that she's not, you know, wearing a maple leaf, she's done so much for this country anyway. Uh, won the country a lot of gold medals. So, uh, but yeah, definitely, definitely like, I don't think the circumstances have been talked about to, to your point. It, it really, really, maybe now it'll be discussed a little bit more and why she left after she wins gold, but yeah, the, definitely a dominating performance for her. And congrats to her. And also the the curlers are in action. Canada's curlers are both in situations where they cannot lose anymore. We're in an interesting situation here in the Olympics because <laughs> after essentially dominating the sport over the last few Olympics, uh, Canada might be in a situation where none of their curling teams qualify for the the, the knockout round. So very I interesting read, situation. I take a little bit of offense to that statement. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like uh, dominating the last couple of Olympics. Hey, they won a lot of gold, <laughs> no, no, man. No, 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 not going to mention any other countries here. But uh, you know, as a Swede, I take a bit of offense. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, listen, Sweden, Sweden's got their five golds already in in these Olympics, so Sweden's doing all right. Canada's only got one. We're hey, we're, wh- we're sucking uh, compared to usual. Although I, f- I do find it kind of funny because like uh, you can always tell how your like Olympic country is doing based on how they sort the medal table. And from <laughs> the Vancouver Olympics up until now, I'm pretty sure CBC has always sorted the medal table by like golds and then total. <laughs> and now they're sorting by total. Yeah, well, the guardian doesn't. So it's, it's uh, Norway. Is still, it's still the Olympics uh, or uh, Norwegian in invitational t- tournaments for, for uh, the guardian or us here in Europe. <laughs> Where goals carry more weight. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, the, the, the funny thing is that I, there's not really many Canadians other than maybe Mikhail Kingsbury that have disappointed, right? Like, yeah. I feel like there's been more surprises. Like, more of the bronze have been surprises. You look at aerial, team aerials and, uh, you know, downhill, like, or, or sorry, not the, uh, the Alpine combined. Like, 
Th those are not Canadian events. <laughs> ski jumping? They kind of won a medal in ski jumping? Like, what are we talking about? About half the field was um, disqualified. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey. You know, part of the best the best ability is availability, Patrick. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I mean, like, it's... it's. Um, I think, you know, for... You see it with Sweden as well. I mean, we have a good good uh, Olympics right now, from, but we start with two goals or three goals in three days. And, and it sort of builds the, the camaraderie in the Olympics. I think it's extra because there are so many sports in, in the same location. Uh, you see it in Summer Olympics, you see it in, in Winter Olympics. Once a country gets going, it sort of gives everyone that extra 5% or half percent maybe uh, to, to, yeah. to actually get that extra medal or, or something like that. And, and uh, there's definitely, that there's definitely a, a, a good point. Yeah, there's definitely momentum when it comes yeah. to countries. Like, it, there's definitely, like, it, there's definitely that that aspect. Absolutely. Like, if you get off to a good start, it just makes everyone want to push more. And I, and I think that's a, a very good. And point. maybe relax more as well, so you can push more. Yeah, I feel like that's the other thing, right? Is that if your country is doing well and they've got some golds, I feel like there's a level of pressure that's no longer on you. Like, well, if I mess up. <laughs> nobody's going to be too upset because we're doing well. Whereas like if you have a bunch yeah. of people who are favored for gold and they are already messed up and now <laughs> you have to feel like you have to win gold for your country to yeah. be like not freaking out. Right. It's, <laughs> it's a weird situation. The Olympics, it's like, it's great. And also we get this like nationalistic tendency that puts oh, a lot of pressure on athletes that don't necessarily make the money to earn that pressure. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> but it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's it, still maybe. fun. Some, some of these uh, <laughs> I mean, athletes are only out there every four years in the public exactly. domain. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah. they're, you know, back to their little corner shop where, where they have to, <laughs> to perform. And I mean, like, I like it. Uh, there's always some new people that you cheer for, no matter what countries they come from. And, and there are the stories that, that, you know, the Olympics are supposed to be about as well. Absolutely. All right. Yeah. We're going to, we're going to wrap it up there. Thanks so much for joining me guys. Uh, we went a little bit longer than the show usually goes, but I enjoyed chatting with you both. And uh, I think Patrick's going to be back a few times this week. Maybe we'll bring in some more Sweden talk and talk about more of the Nordic countries. Although I don't know how much I'm going to allow the cross country skiing talk. Cause uh, it's the worst event in the Olympics. I'm sorry. Hey, Terrible. at least we're going to have like, I think we have a Canadian Sweden matchup to, to come about in, uh, in men's hockey. Perfect. That'll be perfect. We'll talk about that. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody, for watching. And we'll be back right tomorrow at 6 a.m. sharp for Game Over International. Make sure that if you love the show, you head on over to Spotify and give us a rating and like the YouTube video. And hey, uh, download the SDPN app so you can get amazing content from everyone in the company and also buy some amazing merch like this beautiful Game Over mug or this SDPN Pride t-shirt. And uh, we'll see you tomorrow.